Christian nationalism is just a Joel Osteen message with less of a smile, so maybe you take it more seriously. But in the end, it's just as worldly. The verses and reasons for doing it aren't that strong. There are lots of verses to be concerned with doing it. I'm making this on the eve of the 2022 midterm elections where all the more likely candidates who are Christians will win. And I'm sure more and more people will be on the bandwagon for Christian nationalism and see Trump reelected in 2024. Christians are putting more and more of God's enemies under Jesus's foot. This is arguably the stupidest time not to hop for a ride on the Christian nationalist bandwagon. If you're a Christian nationalist or leaning that way, I'm not here to tell you to vote left. I probably vote the same right way as you every time, and I don't foresee myself ever not voting as right as I can. I see Christian nationalists say they're only critiqued from the left or from liberals. I'm not a liberal or a progressive. You might think liberal Christians won't toughen up on the true gospel. But I think you won't toughen up on the real message that once you proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, it's a death sentence. Where I see the Christian nationalism crowd as thinking proclaiming the gospel is just an alternative lifestyle choice. Probably where we differ the most is I take it literally when Jesus says don't try to save your life in this world that he means it's a death sentence like he actually died. What I'm accusing you is taking losing your life to only be it's a high-minded, abstraction, alternative lifestyle choice that you're no threat of literally dying, just you voluntarily stop only living to sin and for the flesh. I understand why someone is tempted toward Christian nationalism. At the end of the day tomorrow, you and I are going to be voting the same way. Two years from now, we will also be voting the same way. For the foreseeable future, we will probably be voting the same way. It's less embarrassing to have your positive Christian nationalism outlook. It seems more reasonable to be a Christian nationalist, that God wants us to pursue the good, to be good stewards, to push back against the darkness. It sounds nice that you have a vision and a goal. Where my pessimistic view that the devil is the God of this age, Paul wrote that well after Jesus' ascension. He also wrote that the devil blinds the minds of unbelievers. That's embarrassing to admit and that we lack control. It's hard to build momentum around that stark verse. It's not just Paul. John also wrote this after Jesus' ascension to heaven. 1 John 5.19 We know we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. If Paul and John wrote that the devil rules this world and blinds the minds of unbelievers, it's hard to see the utility in setting up a booth in the devil's crooked carnival and thinking he's going to let you stay long. The devil had Jesus killed, Peter and Paul, and if the Christian history is correct, all the apostles except for John were killed. It's one thing to evangelize at the devil's carnival, to be ready, to be on the move, like Jesus or later Paul when they tried to grab him. But to think you can sit put and set up a government seems to be out of step with Jesus and the apostles. Jesus told his disciples, go out and proclaim the gospel to all nations. The gospel is the dead will be raised like Jesus was and we can have eternal life if we accept Jesus' death paid for our sins. Jesus did not tell his disciples they would be successful in getting everyone to believe and obey his commands. Didn't he say something like the road is narrow and few find it? Jesus did not tell his disciples to run for public office or start mega corporations or to start their own island nation. Jesus never said you will get everyone in the world to obey me. Then I will come back and say, great job with the world. You guys got it all swept and clean and polished. Now let's all have a great eternal life. Every foretelling of Jesus' return to earth is he's not happy with the state of the world and he's coming back to crush the beast ruling it. I've done other videos on that topic, but since it's true that the state of the world is bad when Jesus returns, it's foolish to spend a lot of time and energy on playing fantasy politics of how to make the ideal kingdom. We have other chores to do. God wants us to be spreading the gospel, not getting sidetracked in dreams of making an earthly utopia with Joel Osteen as the president. Even if you argue the founding of America is your crown jewel example of what a Christian nation is and the good that's done, if Romans 13 means all government is of God and to never rebel, then George Washington really messed up by rebelling against England. If you're not to rebel and all government is on its face, the authority established by God, 
then you should be content with whatever political party is in the White House or in the House or the Senate. You should not oppose North Korea or the Chinese or any Islamic government authority which outlaws or persecutes or kills Christians since they are the authority established by God. To rebel against them is to rebel against God. Of course, I have a lot of problems with Romans 13. I think it's more complicated than straightforward. All governments are always good and they only attack the bad because Jesus, Peter, and Paul were killed by the Roman government, which was bad. The mark of the beast will be bad. The mark of the beast system will kill those who refuse to accept it. Refusing it is good. You will get a thousand years to reign with Christ in the millennium kingdom on earth. I bring up Romans 13 because I heard that as one of the key arguments for Christian nationalism. And I think it's not a good reason to desire to take over politics. Peter wrote this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse starting at 18. Honor the emperor, slaves, and reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Peter says, honor the emperor, submit yourselves to your masters, the good and the bad. Peter was most likely killed by the emperor. If Romans 13 means all governments are good and to always obey, then why are you worried who runs the government? Whoever it is, it's God ordained, and to oppose them would to oppose God. I say that to show you, you can't take a lazy copy and paste approach to that verse to show God approves of all governments and therefore Christians should aspire to work in the government. If anything, Romans 13 is a sign to stay away or out of governments or don't worry about it. When Paul talked to government officials, he never asked for a job or gave them advice how to rule. He instead tried to persuade them of the gospel. We should follow his example. Here are some reasons why being focused on earthly things like governments is at best a distraction from our more important things to keep in mind. Philippians 3, starting halfway through 13. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And in some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to that what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. So real clear, Paul isn't saying, hey, wait to make your own nation, wait to make your own country. He's saying we should be expecting and waiting for Jesus coming back from heaven to earth, not to be setting up our own earthly kingdom. And Paul's saying, hey, if you're mature, you accept that. If not, God's going to bring you around to it. Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. See at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is adultery. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So you might say, oh, Paul's only saying stop living for the flesh. Paul's not saying don't run for government or care about taking care of your house and building on a new addition and raising the property value. Paul's only saying, hey, quit sinning, quit being about the flesh. Let's read that again. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. See at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So he didn't say not some earthly things or just fleshly things. He's saying all earthly things. Set your mind on things above, 
Don't have your mind on Christian nations or things that are on the earth. For you died, and your life now is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That, that's our hope. That's our expectation. That's what we're looking for. Hey, when Christ comes back, we're going to be with him. Then we can have our kingdom on earth when he's the king. From Paul's words, it's hard to believe he would tell you. It's hard to believe Paul would tell you to set your mind on anything that's earthly, whether it's neutral, maybe even seemingly positive. If anything from Paul's writings, it's no, only be thinking about heavenly things and about Jesus's return to earth. Because here's what Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. So if he's saying, hey, be a soldier with me, with Jesus Christ, and if you do that, don't get entangled in civilian affairs. So civilian affairs, I think that covers all the government stuff. I'm not saying I do that perfectly. Tomorrow, I'm gonna to vote the same way you are. Two years from now, I'm gonna vote the same way you are. The next verses are less straightforward. I've done individual videos on both these verses, but I think they help to throw weight beyond how the authors of the New Testament thought about this stuff of this world and why getting involved with how to manage the stuff of this world is at best a distraction from pursuing the Spirit of God. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires passes away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So if it's the last hour, why are you concerned with the politics and the government? I've done an individual video on that because, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That I think God's saying he so loved the people of the world. But in the first John, he's saying, do not love the world. He's saying, don't love the stuff of the world. The governments, your house, your possessions, the things, the stuff of this world. Yes, you should love the people of the world. Yes, God loves the people of the world. But do not love the things, the stuff of this world. James 4, 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means end to me with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? It, it's hard to read that and go, well, you know what, from that I gather I should get into politics. I see how getting in politics seems much more about being friendship with the world and that you're making God jealous because you're not waiting for him to come back and set up his kingdom on earth, but you're trying to set up your own kingdom now or in some ways getting ties with the God of this age, the God of this world, the devil. And how could that not make God jealous? Paul, John, James, Peter, that's nice, but what about Jesus? Didn't he tell his disciples, go make everyone obey me and you will be successful? You will get everyone to obey me? Yes, he did tell them, go try, but he did not guarantee that everyone would believe. In fact, it's hard to believe anyone could come away with that pie in the sky optimism when Jesus told them, if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. Or Jesus describing how awful the world will be at his return. It doesn't make sense if the world would be in an awful state at Jesus's arrival, that Christians would be successful in getting every nation and individual to obey everything Jesus taught. The only conclusion is, not many would be holding on to Jesus' teachings at his arrival, and most of the world went from bad to worse. Enough of me and Paul and Peter and James and John. What did Jesus say about being politically active? One of the twelve, Simon the Zealot, must have been a politically active person. Didn't Jesus tell his followers to follow him after he ascended? Oh, that's right, he didn't. Jesus said this, though. Matthew 6, 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moss and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moss and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Still Matthew 6, down to verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which was here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or who shall we vote for? Or what shall we wear? Now I put in the vote there. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. John 12, 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Matthew 10. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Maybe Jesus was just talking to the 12 apostles, and that has no bearing on us, even though the apostles were meant to teach everyone else and to be examples. We can say, no, what Jesus said to them means the opposite for us. But Jesus didn't just say, this is for you guys, only the apostles. He said, whoever. Matthew 16, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Luke 9, 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Once you start trying to rationalize and go, but we have to have some laws, vote some way, you're missing the lifeboat that left. We're just here to tell others about the world Jesus will remake and for them to put their vote of faith in that world, in that life, not here. Here they should expect to suffer and die and give up their life in this world. Do I oppose voting for Christian and politician? No, but I don't think it makes that much of a difference. I don't think voting is as meaningful as you guys think. If the God of this age is the devil, then I think it's an illusion if you think you can vote him out. The end of Matthew is not the only side of the story we get about Jesus giving his final instruction. In the beginning of Acts, Acts 1 verse 7, Jesus said to them, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Jesus didn't say you will overthrow, set up my government and all these places, just be his witnesses. Mm -hmm.